so I just wanted to clarify one thing real quick uh, earlier in the first part of the uh, talk you saw this slide I think and this is QT interval so I just wanted to clarify it's the uh, milliseconds it's not seconds so uh, QT interval is prolonged here in the form of milliseconds so I just wanted to clarify so let's see how we approach a patient who comes in with loss of consciousness so one of the two things will be uh, uh, the scenarios one would be that patient either would be unconscious at the time when they present so in that case of course uh, this is a red flag situation obviously you will manage the patient uh, ABC will be done and then you will run labs and tests and then go back and look at the history and um, or simultaneously collect the history and uh, collect all the data and uh, work it up so it's more in the reverse order and the other scenar scenario would be the patient would be actually conscious at the time and you will uh, do the regular history and physical exam and you'll uh, get as much information as possible this would be a previous episode and then you will run labs and tests accordingly so uh, this would be a transient loss of consciousness obviously you'll get all the information it can be a um, as you can recall, any causes of syncope, vasovagal concussion, seizures, orthostatic hypertension, cardiac rhythm problems, and then uh, these obviously are transient causes. Uh, some of them, for example, neurological causes and alcohol and drugs, and uh, rhythm problems if they are sustained, or orthostatic problems if they are not um, uh, corrected, can lead to prolonged loss of consciousness. So along with that, uh, of course, there are systemic causes, which you, we just covered all of them. So all these are going to be prolonged uh, causes of loss of consciousness. So how we approach this would be that, let's say the patient had a transient loss of consciousness, then these questions become the most important questions uh, to ask about the history. So of course, we'll ask about onset, uh, duration, position, trigger, uh, or uh, prodrome, and then we'll ask about any recent fluid loss, aura, palpitations, trauma, and emotional trigger. So these are the things that will point us to one direction or the other. So for example, if the patient says that, yeah, they actually did have a trigger, for example, uh, they uh, uh, coughed really hard or something happened, then it may be, or if there was an emotional situation that made them feel um, different uh, in somehow, and uh, uh, in that, and they just lost consciousness, and all of a sudden they uh, basically recovered from it, then they're more likely to have vasovagal syncope, um, also, uh, they may just have a prodrome right before that, and we went over all this. Um, if the patient was standing up from a sitting position or lying position, then uh, orthostatic hypertension should be considered, especially uh, if you ask the patient about fluid loss recently and they say yes to that, then uh, maybe it was orthostatic hypertension. If the patient had some palpitations just prior to loss of consciousness, then of course we'll think about cardiac rhythm problems. Um, if the patient had any aura just prior to loss of consciousness and then after they woke up from the uh, situation they had postictal weakness or paralysis or uh, tiredness then maybe it was a seizure and if somebody witnessed a seizure then obviously it becomes very easy to make the diagnosis but if uh, nobody saw the seizure obviously the patient doesn't remember seizure activity then uh, uh, you can ask these additional questions if there was a trauma, then obviously uh, you would think that it's likely concussion. And in case of vasovagal syncope, if that's the diagnosis you have arrived at, then you don't need to do any diagnostic tests. No treatment is required. These patients do very well uh, without any treatment, and usually it's a self-limiting problem. If it was orthostatic hypertension based upon your uh, history, then obviously you will check the blood pressure, you will review blood pressure medications, you will do the orthostatics, um, so a drop in the systolic blood pressure of more than 20 and diastolic of more than 10 within five minutes of standing up uh, will basically confirm the diagnosis and you will look at the skin turgor. Uh, these people will have a uh, low urine output or if you check their urine, uh, they uh, likely would have high specific gravity. So that's how you will make the diagnosis. If the patient um, uh, told you a few things about palpitations and also maybe they had shortness of breath during that time, if it was a, a rhythm problem, then uh, you will of course do cardiac exam. At that time, when you are examining the patient, the rhythm may be completely normal. EKG actually may will be completely normal um, for the most part because this would have been a transient rhythm to cause transient loss of consciousness. So you can do a Holter monitor, you can do 
um, uh, and you can get the diagnosis like it may be uh, ventricular tachycardia or AFib or long QT syndrome or many other things. Let's say the patient had a seizure based upon your history, then of course you will do the EEG. Um, you will check for secondary causes of seizures because um, especially if it was a new onset seizure uh, and you don't know yet if it was epilepsy or not, then of course drugs can be, uh, drug tests can be done, metabolic panel can be drawn, uh, glucose can be tested and a CT scan of the head can be done and should be done if it was an older person who um, started with a seizure uh, as a first seizure in their life. And uh, for very little children, uh, they, um, they may develop febrile seizures too, so just kind of keep that in mind. Um, seizure activity will, uh, would need to be explored. Um, if a witness uh, can give you more information, you can ask them. And based upon the information, you can decide whether it was a petite mal seizure or absent seizure or a grand mal seizure and con convulsions. So that's how you will approach it. If the patient had trauma, then obviously uh, right after the trauma, they um, may report or uh, a friend or a family member or a witness can report that they were very confused. They had some amnesia or headaches. So any of these features can be present. Uh, you will check for the lucid interval. You'll make sure that the patient is not in that interval at the time before you dismiss the patient. And then of course you can do the CT scan of the head and rule out subdural hematoma and other things. So if the patient has a prolonged loss of consciousness, and let's say uh, you are thinking about any of these um, problems going on or, or problems arising from, uh, from any of these systems going on, then obviously there are many, many different things that uh, can be looked for in history and physical exam. First, the most common uh, causes of loss of consciousness uh, for these systemic problems would be metabolic, alcohol, and drugs and pulmonary causes and neurological causes so these are the most common and then uh, cardiac causes too but then of course other things can cause it too if the patient is unconscious at the time uh, which it probably would be the case uh, because this patient uh, has not been able to compensate for the uh, for the uh, the original problems that happened or the original pathology that happened in the body so obviously you'll first do the abc and then you'll start looking for oops you'll start looking for um, a Glasgow coma score you will evaluate the patient right away of course if the score is low then you will intubate the patient uh, if the patient is hypotensive you'll give them fluids if their glucose is low you will administer it if uh, uh, you suspect that they've had alcohol intoxication you will give them thiamine um, and you'll draw labs urine test CT scan of the head and the EKG and troponin and chest x-ray so you'll basically do the whole battery of tests uh, because you are trying to at this point uh, revive the patient and you're not necessarily taking history from the patient because it's not possible you will uh, collect data uh, in uh, whatever way possible anyway so you you will review the patient's chart or we can ask the family members or uh, whatever uh, or review medical records if they are available anywhere and look for clues in the history if this is a scenario where the patient has a prolonged loss of consciousness and at the time of eva evaluation is unconscious so the clues in history would be something like this uh, so if the patient complained about headache prior to this then obviously you'll think that about neurological causes and maybe subarachnoid hemorrhage um, in the prior history uh, there would be history of uncontrolled hypertension cva or seizures and uh, uh, maybe if this was a new seizure then obviously you will check for a brain tumor in old people or I shouldn't say old people, but uh, relatively older people. Uh, patient had recent alcohol use, and obviously you'll think about it. A drug use, the same thing. If the patient had shortness of breath uh, before losing consciousness or had a recent MI, let's say just a few days ago, then obviously, and maybe chest pain, then you, obviously you'll think about ongoing um, cardiac insult or maybe Dressler syndrome or things like that and further complications of myocardial infarction. And you will think maybe the patient went into cardiac failure and then that is how they have lost consciousness again shortness of breath um, will also give you clues maybe it is a pulmonary problem so you will think about either PE effusion or pneumothorax so all those things that can cause obstructive shock you will uh, think about those diagnoses and then if the patient has a history uh, of uncontrolled diabetes and by this time you've drawn the labs and the glucose is really high uh, you will think about DKA and in case of um, patient complaining about fatigue, which this is going to be a very unlikely uh, scenario, um, 
because this is usually a progressive problem and if they have complained about cold intolerance or you know from history that they have uh, thyroid problems then maybe they've gone into mixed edema coma if they have uh, had a problem with too much swelling in the lower extremity and you're thinking about any fluid retention uh, then maybe they just went into renal failure and by virtue of that uh, went into uh, into uh, shock because of too much fluid overload uh, patient also uh, if uh, has clues in history on, upon review of medical chart or from family uh, it shows that maybe they have had chronic alcohol use on exam they have ascites and maybe they just had a GI bleed recently then you'll think about liver failure you'll look for viral hepatitis uh, in their chart if they've had a diagnosis recently or previously if they've had recent uh, diarrhea and dehydration and it, it's just an acute problem they look very uh, uh, basically dehydrated then you'll think about maybe an acute GI loss uh, thereby causing severe hypotension and then in hematological causes usually these people would be already hospitalized so you can um, recall that uh, when we talked about DIC these people usually have a uh, problem going on already and this is usually an end result of the problem where there is multi-organ failure and bleeding and then if they had infection and they for uh, whatever reason they were either admitted for an infection or they just uh, are brought in and you already know they have fever and low blood pressure then maybe you're dealing with a septic shock so these are some clues in the history that you can look for uh, basically I just repeated everything we talked about in the last uh, hour or so and then there are additional signs you can look for so for example in case of uncontrolled hypertension or headache and when you're thinking or suspecting a cerebrovascular accident on physical exam you will notice either decelebrate or decorticate rigidity if the patient is comatose facial asymmetry asymmetric pupils or things like that so these are just the physical exam signs um, that you will notice if the patient has neurological cause um, uh, of loss loss of consciousness in case of uh, a patient who let's say had uh, an older patient who had a brain tumor or anybody who for, for that matter uh, has a brain tumor uh, and let's say they started with a seizure and that's how they lost consciousness you may notice froth on their uh, physical exam and maybe they've had a history of weight loss uh, alcohol use breath then you uh, you can see in uh, case of drug use you may notice needle marks on the hands the pupil size may be uh, constricted based upon whatever the drug it is or dilated in some situ situations uh, patient with cardiac problems uh, cardiogenic causes of loss of consciousness usually have either a murmur or, or they also would be hypotensive uh, patient with pulmonary causes would have decreased pulse oxygen uh, and then also uh, breath sounds would be decreased they may have a ketotic breath they may um, have uh, hypothermia and bradycardia in case of mixed edema coma they may have dependent edema in case of renal failure uh, and then in case of liver failure they may uh, have ascites on the exam and some of the other uh, stigma of the liver disease they also uh, may have decreased urine output and the skin turgor would be really bad and then based upon the physical exam you can tell they are extremely dehydrated and by this time you've already started the fluids so you know what's going on and in case of DIC uh, causing shock they obviously uh, would be bleeding from multiple parts of the body in case of septic shock of course you will notice fever hypertension and tachycardia which is basically a classic triad of septic shock so these are the additional signs that usually uh, reviewing uh, the signs and the symptoms from review of uh, medical records uh, you can get to the diagnosis very quickly so these um, uh, this process does not take very long um, the, the idea is to stabilize the patient first and then get as much information as possible so you can treat the underlying pathology so this is the last slide so I just wanted to uh, put it all together in terms of pathophysiologic mechanism so for any uh, loss of consciousness to occur in the body uh, for anyone uh, there has to be a damage to the ascending reticular activating system so we, uh, we talked about that already now there are several ways that uh, the damage can occur um, so for example there can be direct damage there can be decreased oxygenation and there can be increased pressure uh, in the brain so these three blue mechanisms will lead to uh, damage to the ascending reticular activating system decrease oxygenation direct damage and increase pressure so these are the three uh, 
and then of course there are several mechanisms in the body that can lead to these problems so we can start from here so you can see direct damage can be either because of hypothermia or it can be direct trauma to the brain that can cause direct damage uh, direct trauma can also cause herniation or can cause raised intracranial pressure so these two mechanisms can eventually lead to high pressure or raised intracranial pressure which will cause a damage to the reticular activating system so that's how this will go and then you can see that several things can lead to uh, herniation so space occupying lesion in the brain subarachnoid hemorrhage or intracerebral hemorrhage in, uh, can cause raised intracranial pressure so these are the underlying pathologies the sub, uh, space occupying lesion or, and the hemorrhage and the hypothermia and the trauma are underlying pathologies which through these mechanisms will cause damage to the reticular acti activating system and that's how people lose consciousness on the other hand if there is uh, decreased oxygenation which you can see most of the systemic problems will lead to eventually decreased oxygenation and that's how people lose consciousness so we can start from anywhere um, so let's just let's start from here so if a patient has anaphylaxis so anaphylactic shock will basically uh, uh, by definition will cause decreased oxygenation because the pe people are not able to oxygenate well uh, when there is too much obstruction in the upper airway that's how uh, and also there are, there, this is a two-fold mechanism because not only there is obstruction to the airway but also there is massive vasodilatation because of the uh, tox uh, the chemicals and the toxins that are being released with anaphylaxis itself so that's how these people will um, uh, oxygenate very poorly and uh, lose consciousness and then we can start from here so you can see in case of pneumothorax a COPD effusion any pulmonary uh, problem or underlying pathology that has not been able to get corrected and it has advanced to the point where people have uh, gone into respiratory failure it will cause of course respiratory acidosis and then several other things can cause respiratory acidosis for example drugs and toxins and alcohol these things can do it too so all of these mechanisms when they lead to respiratory acidosis the pH is too low and that's how people are not oxygenating uh, in case of metabolic acidosis through several mechanisms and these are just a few uh, DKA, lactic acidosis, alcohol and uremia these are the most common causes of metabolic acidosis these can cause decreased oxygenation through this people who go into sepsis uh, so an untreated infection can cause metabolic acidosis as well in addition to that sepsis will uh, also cause low cardiac output because of massive vasodilatation in the body and that's how uh, through these two mechanisms there is decreased oxygenation uh, and then low cardiac output and people lose consciousness so let's look at this side of the slide so for example if you have severe gastroenteritis or there is a lot of uh, heat loss and there is uh, anything that's causing fluid loss from the body the dehydration will lead to, lead to hypotension cardiac output or decreased cardiac output will also lead to hypotension cause decreased circulation and uh, cause decreased oxygenation on the other hand liver failure adrenal crisis mi cardiac tamponade will also will cause uh, cardiac failure and all of these mechanisms you can see there are several things that will cause hypertension and then eventually lead to loss of consciousness so that is how uh, we die but anyway this is the slide putting it all together in terms of pathophysiology and underlying mechanisms so this is i think the end of it uh, we finished loss of consciousness i hope you uh, enjoyed it as much as i did i hope you uh, are as excited as i am uh, that it's done it's over it's finished uh, capstone um, is almost over and i hope you uh, found it to be helpful um, good luck and i wish you the best in your future careers and beyond thank you